All right. Thank you, Dana, and thanks to all of our speakers today. That was our last presentation. Uh, let's get to the questions. You can raise your hand to ask a question, or you can type a question in the question chat box. Um, remember to tell us who you are if you're going to use your microphone. And I see we already have a couple typed into the chat. Uh, yeah, this is Ron. I've been kind of tracking as it goes, and uh, maybe we could just start with Dana since we just finished up, and uh, uh, Rick uh, Stratton had a question about how uh, Canada and British Columbia in particular tracks and prioritizes uh, tanker retardant drops. Uh, we have a process that we call RSwap, and it's just a, a, a resource sharing uh, uh, process and what we do is daily each fire is set as a priority so all requests uh, for existing fires uh, go through that process so the number one fire gets gets the resources it asks for and number 10 you're uh, you're probably not getting much for resources uh, and again uh, during the summer we we really uh, put our priority on uh, new starts uh, especially this year where we were we were well beyond resources and you know we would try to uh, put as much aircraft horsepower on a fire at, at the start that we could and this was the first year that we actually we went to a lot of next generation uh, we were using the BA 85 jets uh, and uh, the Q400 air tankers uh, so a lot quicker air tankers and a lot uh, but able to get to a lot more fires a lot quickly with a with a pretty good payload of retardant. So it did work out for us that way, but it's basically following that resource sharing allocation process. Hey, it's Rick. I, I was just wondering on tracking, do you guys track your retardant drops? We're trying uh, to improve on that in the US. Yeah, we're we're uh, like I say, we, this is the first year that we have uh, what we declared our next generation air tankers. Uh, so we uh, we still use the Electra 188s. Uh, we have the Convair 580s, but we've uh, we've kind of increased with the Q400s and the uh, DRJ85 jets that uh, we're able to get retardants. And again, they their payloads are I got to do the math in my head. Their their payloads are around about uh, 1,800 gallons. So we're able to move that retardant a lot quicker, and uh, yeah, we're we're still testing pattern drops uh, and you know and coverage levels, but uh, we did find that, that that increased our effectiveness quite a bit this year. Thanks, and uh, again, it shows the the value of getting us all together in this uh, webinar um, just to kind of share notes. Uh, I see a hand up from Arunas if you'd like to pose your question. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. This is Arunas. I work at the Naval Research Lab in Monterey, California. Um, my current project is looking how to uh, use satellite uh, sounders to uh, look at the preconditions, preconvective conditions for Pyro CB development. Um, Wesley, I was very interested in your uh, bullet point about uh, temperatures being that high, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, my question is, over the past couple of years, how often does something that this kind of a heat dome, a high heat dome, occur in uh, British Columbia? Uh, this was basically the first year that the quote unquote heat dome really hit. But, uh, you, you know, the area where the community was lost, Lytton, you know, it's not uncommon to have temperatures in the, and again, I'll speak in Celsius, the mid 40 degree range. Uh, but it, the heat dome was kind of a very concentrated uh, event, uh, you know, and I showed you where I live, kind of central, cent center of BC. Uh, we had, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a temperature of minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we broke a temperature record where we were 42.3 degrees, I think it was, uh, during the heat dome. Uh, so, you know, we are jokingly saying we've gone for minus 40 and we've done plus 40. So, um, in the southern interior where the bulk of the fires were, yeah, it's not uncommon to have temperatures 100 degrees Fahrenheit plus there uh, for, for periods of time. But the heat dome was concentrated for the complete area of the province, uh, areas near the 60th parallel where 
uh, almost 40 degrees Celsius as well. So it, uh, it was a big dome that affected the whole province. But this was the first time that phenomenon was labeled in British Columbia. Well, I'll take a look at, uh, you know, I'm trying to develop cases uh, and I might include uh, your area in terms of yeah. potential piracy B development areas. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah. thank you. Great talk. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and uh, let folks know we are at noon or uh, two hour limit, but I think still got a few good questions. Uh, I'll summarize some uh, question for uh, Risk management and, and Rick in particular, probably from Sean McEldry. Uh, regional smoke was often a factor for downwind fires last summer. Any movement toward linking or coupling fire behavior and smoke modeling in the uh, risk uh, platform? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, we are having discussions on if we want to have that, say, air quality as one of those HVRAs that is included in the fire comparison spreadsheet. Until then, I would direct you to the risk management dashboard. One of the last tabs on the right is a link to Air Now, and it's excellent. It shows um, uh, the concern to the communities uh, in regard to uh, particulate matter in the air, as well as the dispersion. So that's just a fantastic resource, and it has um, both temporary and permanent monitors. So. It's a, it's a sweet uh, website, it's embedded. Thanks, uh, Rick. And uh, there was another question on the Decision Support Center. It's really just kind of looking at a daily uh, uh, schedule, what it looked like. And so, Mark, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how that schedule played out and how it might evolve in the future, uh, particularly to tackle some of the limitations you and, and others talked about? Um, so the, the daily schedule, um, we had two set calls and trying to find times when folks could uh, meet, um, you know, with all the other planning meetings and stuff was a challenge, but we were able to find times in the evening for that. And, you know, there were people who were on NMAC calls and whatnot. For, from our part, there was just a lot of wheeling and dealing going on from seven o'clock in the morning until we had those calls generally. Um, and like I say, Alan Hepworth and myself did a lot of stuff, Tim. But uh, yeah, this the scheduling, it, it, and maybe if there was a little more um, organization to some of this, like I say, after we talk about it over the winter, we could go to, you know, by daily, you know, ca calls at less regular intervals and stuff. But with the way things were this year, just stayed super active and we were doing calls at night every single night and we almost had to just to kind of keep pace and keep track of what was going on so um with the, the normal decision supports you know they have sketch sch schedules they do calls in the am with the analyst a lot of times and then they'll do a dsc call and then evenings they'll have report outs for the day and, that, and we hit we didn't get into that just because we didn't want to inundate uh, folks with calls well, good. Thanks, Mark. And I think that, that captures it. And yeah, there was a lot of conversations. Much appreciated. Um, question for uh, NIROPS, uh, I think Tom in particular, from Rick uh, Stratton. Uh, thanks for the awesome product over all the years. Uh, wondering with the advent of FireGuard, 15-minute updates, and these other tools uh, that Zach was talking about, um, do you foresee the need for NIROPS to decline uh, at all? Any any thoughts on the future of that? Hmm, it's a good question. I when you say decline, I I don't know if you mean that you think there might be fewer requests coming into NIROPS. Um, I think the more other assets that are out there, it could reduce some requests. Like we and even this year at the very beginning when the big lightning bus happened, we were getting a couple of requests for lightning detection flights, just with huge boxes that we couldn't possibly fly. And it was very nice with DRTI and the new fire imaging to be able to push them in that direction so that those orders didn't keep coming in. But we're also seeing just more and more incidents out there wanting the type of product we, which we produce, which is not just the perimeter, but then here's the concentrations of heat, the intense and the scattered. Um, so I, I really don't know if, if 
I see those additional assets coming in as necessarily reducing the request we have in NIROPS and just the fact that the conditions, the fire season is getting longer, you know, more intense with climate change. Um, so yeah, it remains to be seen if we're ever going to see a, a, a real decrease in the orders that come into NIROPS. Thanks. And, uh, and uh, a comparable question for Zach, uh, is the FireGuard data archived and available somewhere for future reference? So it is, uh, I'd have to, Sean is the, Sean Triplett is the lead for that. So I'm not going to go too far in it, but it is um, available within the FC AGOL organization. There's a couple um, dashboards and, and feature services in there. And then also just to be clear with FireGuard is that, you know, it, it currently and is not anticipated to be a perimeter mapping product. Uh, it would be in a detection and uh, progression type product, but not necessarily strategic mapping like we see out at IROPS. And then as far as the other assets, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's key that we get standards in place so that when we have a product that's produced, we know exactly what that product is and isn't. And then we can have those discussions on where it's appropriate to augment um, or substitute a product from one resource with another. So. So that's where it's really key of having input from from you know this community and others as we develop that standardization from kind of the wild wild west um, configuration we have available to us now. Thanks, appreciated, and I think that's all the questions that were posted, and I don't see any hands raised. So pass it back uh, to you, uh, Ben and Wes. All right, thanks, Ron, for moderating that Q and A. Um, so we've come to the end of the presentation. Thanks to everybody for sticking around a few extra minutes. Uh, we've recorded today's webinar and the recording will be hosted on the Fire Environment Continuing Education Subcommittee homepage. The link is uh, posted there on the webinar screen. Uh, give us a couple weeks to get the videos ready and posted. Um, thanks everyone for your participation. Enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you next spring.